as we remarked last week, the young man who chose the School of Wisdom has progressed in his development of the skills for living a godly life and for making life-enhancing choices. He can recite with great authority the school motto, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And last week we noted that Proverbs 25 through 29 were an addendum to Solomon's original work that were added by King Hezekiah during a time of spiritual renewal for God's people that was led by the king. Today, we find another addendum. And so Proverbs 30 will begin with verse one. These are the words of Agur, son of Jacob, the oracle. So the prophetic words of Agur, which means the collector, the son of Jacob, that the man spake unto Ithiel, which means God with him, even unto Ithiel and Ukal, which means fortified by God. So apparently we have an old man who's considered a learned thinker, whose point of view has a lot of depth to it. And then we have these two men who are recording what he says. The man, Edgar, declares, I am weary, O God, I am weary, O God, and worn out. Verse 2, surely I'm too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom. That is, I've never been to school like the wise men. Nor have I knowledge of the Holy One, who is the source of wisdom. So why would Agur, who supposedly is a man with a lot of insight and someone people look up to, began by saying, I'm more stupid than anybody. I really don't understand much about God or about life. Perhaps the reason for his announcement about himself is discovered in verse four, it's where what he's doing is looking primarily into the heavens and comparing himself to the living God. Verse four, who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all of the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. And these are very similar to the questions God asked Job. When Job got done complaining about how unfairly he had been treated, the Lord said, uh, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? That's in Job 38, verse 4. And then in God goes on to talk about his creative activity, and we can imagine him with the wind in his fist and the waters in his garment, establishing the ends of the earth. And Job gets so overwhelmed when he realized that he'd spent much of his time thinking about himself and so little time focusing on God. Well, Edgar, too, finds himself overwhelmed, and he's been thinking about God. If you look, he even anticipates some New Testament theology. The Son of God, who became known to us by name. But he still realizes there's still much to learn about God. There's still a lot of mystery there as well. And so he asked the listeners to think and answer the questions if they can about this extraordinary being, this God of mystery and power. If you remember the way Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, blessed are those who have grasped their essential poverty, their limits. There are weaknesses. So as we continue in verse 5, we will hear Agur speak of two important facets of his life, the value he places on God's word and prayer. And so it's no surprise that a person who is so captivated by God can be a model to us for meditating in scripture and talking with God. Verse 5, every word of God proves true. 
the literal translation of true here is that every word of God is purified. It's the imagery of the firing of silver to get impurities out, the dross. He says, and every word is proven. That is, it's been tested and proven to be free from error. It's proven its worth. God keeps every promise that he makes. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So if you seek his protection, he will be your defense. So when the world is attacking us, undermining us, frightening us, it becomes a place where we can go for help. Verse 6, do not add to his words. Don't claim God said something he didn't say. Don't leave undone anything he commands. The Apocrypha of the Roman Catholic Church, the Latter-day Saints Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price, these are things that violate God's word. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Don't put words of men on the same plane with God's word. Our modern world requires uh, that to the wisdom of the Bible, we must add modern social thinking, psychological things. In the modern world, they say we need two voices, the word of scripture and the word of our contemporary experts. Verse seven, two things I ask of you, God, so Uggers going to share his prayer with us also. And he says, do not deny them to me before I die. And really, he wants God to answer them now so that he may live the rest of his life with them. Verse 8, remove far from me falsehood and lying and give me neither poverty nor riches. So he says, Take away all the false show, all the false appearances, all the vain expectations, all words of deception, all pretenses, all false promises that fail to deliver. And he says, don't make me poor because that would tempt me to have a coaches spirit or cause me to distrust God's goodness or cause me to use it as an excuse for bad behavior. And he says, don't make me rich either and tempt me to be full of myself or addicted to things that become an idol that would replace my God. Now we know there are people who handle poverty and people who handle wealth and love God at the same time, but Edgar didn't think he was one of them. So here we have a man who's measuring himself by God's standard. He says, feed me with a food that is needful for me. He says, feed me with food in the right proportion, not too much, not too little. Give me my daily bread, Jesus would say later. Feed me with a food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? no longer thankful to God for his provision, no longer recognize who provided it, or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. That is, take matters into my own hands and not depend on God's provision. Now in the next five verses, we have this description of Agur's opposite. Verse 10, do not slander a servant to his master. Don't criticize someone to the person they work for. Don't meddle. It's none of your business. And besides, you would have taken advantage of a weaker person. Verse 10. Do not slander a servant to his master lest he curse you for interfering and you be held guilty. 
The next four verses make us aware of four great evils in every generation. Verse 11, there are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. So not only do they not honor their parents, but they treat them with evil. As this person rejects his parents, he thinks the world originates in him. Verse 12, there are those who clean it who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their filth. There are those who are self-righteous and arrogant, pointing to their goodness and purity, but are as dirty rags in God's sight. Verse 13, and there are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high are their eyelids. So there are some people who think they're so good. Oh, how good they think they are. They're full of arrogance and vanity and pride and insolence. Everywhere this person goes, he sees himself in this position of prominence, honor in the spotlight. Do you remember how Herod died in Acts chapter 12? He was a similar kind of man. Acts 12, 21 begins, On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, Oh, this is the voice of a God, and this is not a man. But immediately the angel of the Lord struck him because he didn't give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. So here we had a man who created this big public dice for himself. He sat upon it and he blathered on about nothing important at all. And he had all of these people arranged before him to praise him for being a God, a deity. He was lofty in his own estimation. He had nothing but himself to think about. His horrible end reminds us that there is only one God in the universe and we're not it not any of us. Verse 14, there are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. So there are greedy, cruel, and oppressive people who will take advantage of the poor and needy as a way to make their own living. Now, Edgar is enough of an enthusiast about life that he can make observations about anything. Nosebleeds, little mammals in the rocks, eagles in the sky, fires that don't burn out. Everything in creation, interesting. And Edgar points out that the lessons about life and wisdom are gained from all of these sources. And it'll be characteristic, as you can tell in reading the next passage, that he's listed things in groups of three, then four, and often in order of importance. So in verse 15, aluka, which translates horse leech. Aluka has two daughters who are apparently well known as very lecherous and covetous, and both are named give me. In Old Testament days, people's names had meaning. For this woman whose name is horse leech, she's named for a particularly onerous leech that would attach itself to the nose of a horse while it was taking a drink from a pool of water. And this verse refers to persons who are so excessively covetous and greedy that they'll scarcely let any lot live but themselves. And when they lay hold of anything by which they may make a profit, they don't let go till they've extracted every last portion of good from it. Three things are never satisfied. Four never say enough. The four things that are never satisfied are the world of the dead, a woman without children, dry ground that needs water, and fire. 
the eye that mocks a father and scorns to obey a mother should be picked out by the ravens of the valley and eaten by the vultures. Hager is the kind of man who has an interest in everything. The willingness to let God teach him through creation, the freedom to give up self-promotion long enough to see some other things, to make some observation and pass them on to others. So we'll look at just a couple of these paragraphs where he's teaching us based on his own experiences in nature. Verse 18, three things are too mysterious for me. Four, I do not understand. The way of the eagle flying in the sky, the way of the serpent moving on a rock, the way of a ship navigating the high seas, the way of a man with a virgin. Verse 20, this is the way of an adulteress. So what is the this here? Well, it's the things in verse 18. He said, and these characterize an adulteress. She's like an eagle taking flight to spy out her prey. She's like the serpent Satan with flattery and lies to allure and beguile. She's like the ship exposing itself to the fury of the sea and the dangers of the rocks, risking great consequence. She's like the man seducing the inexperienced maid. As we've seen all through the Old Testament, God portrays those who go after false gods as adulterers. And here the adulteress is the one who draws people away from wisdom, away from the word of God, away from Christ. And then it says, she eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've not done anything wrong. Verse 21, under three things the earth trembles, under four it cannot bear up. He says there's four things that people on this earth can't tolerate living under. Verse 22, living under the rule of a slave when he becomes king, this unprincipled tyrant. Or living under a spiritually blind fool when he's filled with food. This intellectually weak man who has everything at his command and whom none can tolerate. And living under the thumb of a hateful, ill-tempered woman who gets married and living under the rule of a maidservant when she takes the place of her mistress, either because the mistress died or because of the sin of the husband. So she's rude with arrogant lack of respect for the family and servants in the household. Then verse 24, he says, four things on earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their yearly supply of food in the summer. The rock badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the rocks of the cliff. The locust has no king, yet they all march in rank together. The lizard, you can take it in your hands, yet you can find it in the king's palaces. Verse 29, there are four things that are so impressive to watch as they walk. The lion, which is mightiest among the beast and doesn't turn back before any. The strutting rooster, the he goat, and a king whose army is with him. Verse 32, if you've been foolish, exalting yourself, and I don't know anybody who's ever done that. Or if you've been devising evil. Or I don't know anybody who's ever done that. Put your hand on your mouth. Like the leper and cry to God. Unclean, unclean. Put your hand on your mouth. And God will blot out thy offense for he is merciful. Pressing milk produces curds, pressing the nose produces blood, and pressing anger produces strife. Agar is a wise old man. 
He's someone who's had the wisdom and the freedom to worship an extraordinary God and to live in this beautiful, frightening, and fascinating world. So he's somebody worth emulating. His diary is worth reading. He's a man of scripture and a man of prayer. He understands the capacity of human beings to become violent and arrogant and terrible. And yet he's chosen something else. Sylvia and I used to come home from trips and recount all the interesting things we saw. We would make travel videos of our pictures and we would remember with fascination what God's creation is like. The world is fascinating. God is great. And if we're able to see ourselves as we are, our friend Eger tells us we can receive forgiveness rather than promote ourselves. There's a great deal to be learned and joy to be experienced. That's the end of the lesson.